Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our June 17th Spotlight on History. I'm Mary Helen Dellinger, the curator of the Manassas Museum System, and I'm coming to you today from our temporary exhibition gallery here at the museum, where we have just finished installing our newest show called Consider the Source, Interpreting Manassas History on Paper. Now, we're not open to the public yet. We're working really hard to get there but we want to be safe when we get open. So we, re we anticipate that being in phase three of the governor's plan. But we went ahead and got the exhibit all ready for you anyway. So when you're able to visit, when we reopen, it's going to be installed and, and ready to go. So in the meantime, since we're not open yet, we have this great new show. I'm going to share over the next couple of weeks with you small bits and pieces of the exhibit so you can uh, hopefully get really interested in what we have in here. So when you come out, you'll be a little bit familiar with, um, with the new exhibit. Now, for those of you watching at home or possibly watching later, you're probably thinking there's no way that a bunch of old documents is gonna be interesting. But I challenge you to reconsider that. So for this show, our staff took a, a really different approach. We pulled uh, pieces out of our collection, and this is 100% from the museum's collection of stuff. And rather than just put all the documents on the wall and interpret them for you, we put them up, but then we posed a series of questions in each section and with the individual documents to get you to thinking critically about each piece. We want people to know that this is more than just words on paper. You can really learn a lot from all these from all these different pieces. So these might be a little bit tough to see from home because they are paper. We're going to do our best, but again, the show is up for when you come in. So consider the source. Again, the name of the show is divided into four sections, with each section having a very distinct theme. And my great videographer, Lisa, is going to pan down the hallway there so you can see the four different sections. Uh, but today I'm only going to share with you the first section, which is called Changing Social Norms, and three of the documents um, in that section. Now, we started planning the show in early 2019 and selected all the documents that we were going to use back in the fall. And when we did that, we had no idea how relevant some of these pieces were going to be to the national conversation that we're, we're having now. So in the first section here, these documents show how accepted social norms have changed drastically over the last 160 years. So I want to start with this letter, and all of these are originals, and we have them matted with protective um, mylar on them. So this is a letter written by a lady named Melinda Robinson, who lives in New Orleans, to a Mrs. Joseph Johnston, and the date is 1866. The very first line in this really poignant letter reads, Dear Mistress, my family and myself once belonged to your deceased husband and were raised on the farm on which you now live. So think about those words. My, my family and myself once belonged to your deceased husband. So what must it have meant for Melinda to write them? How do you think that she would have felt writing those words to someone else? And without knowing anything else about these two women, what can you almost immediately deduce from, from just that first sentence? So this is kind of a story in this letter, unspoken words. In this letter, Melinda is writing to her mistress, Mrs. Johnson, um, asking for information about her brothers and sisters. So that's what the letter is about. She, Melinda, has been living in New Orleans for the past 20 years. So remember, and in, in I said that the date was 1866, so do that quick math and think about that. What does that piece of information imply? That she moved to New Orleans 20 years before. So that probably means that she didn't move voluntarily if that was 1846. So as you read through the letter, you're kind of given a small story about these two women and their relationship from the point of view of the former enslaved lady else write it for her because she um, was unable to do so herself. So the question that we pose for this document is, what can you learn about the relationship between these two women? Um, whoever did pen this letter had a beautiful hand, so it's very easy to read. So think about that, and, and when you come to see what that means to you. It's a great piece. that. The second document that I want to share today, this is a list of people who have paid the poll tax in Manassas in 1928 and are therefore eligible to vote. So uh, obviously, we're still part of Prince William County then. And so when you look at this list, what do you see on this list? It's a typewritten list with some handwritten notes on it. So the questions we kind of want people to think are, how are the names shown on this list? And what can you learn from how the list is presented? And what might you infer from what voting was like nearly 100 years ago? This document's not quite 100 years old. 
So you'll note that a majority of people listed here are white men. Of the five columns, three, four of them take up, four of them and part of the fifth one are all the names of white men who lived in the area. There are some women listed and they've recently earned the right to vote, so there are a few of them. But look at the disparity between African-American voters and white voters, and why do you think that is? Because you know there were more people living on this list. And for those of you that are not familiar with that, a poll tax was a fee that the government charged in order to, and they called it a tax. It was a way to disenfranchise and other poor people um, for participating in the political process. Obviously, that's not legal now. So that's a great document that we have. We have others like that in the collection from other uh, towns. Great, um, a great document to pair up with the letter that I want to share with you. At first glance, it doesn't look like these. Again, that's what we want you to do is kind of really take a look. It's this third piece right here. And this is a deed for a bill of sale for a burial plot in the West End Cemetery in 1902. And it's between William Foote and I forget the other person's name on here. But he's give, William Foote is um, giving title to a piece of land in the cemetery. It's on here, as it goes through all the legal jargon, that partway down it says, to be used as a burial place for white persons only. So that's actually written into this legal document from 1902. Written right about acceptable social practices and what African-American people had to face at the turn of the 20th century. And would such a thing be permitted today? So the answer to that is obviously no. You can, you can buy a burial plot anywhere. But it does kind of also explain why Manassas has two cemeteries, which is the Manassas City Cemetery, historically been the African-American. Um, obviously, you can be buried wherever you want to today, but they kind of fall. So for those of you that aren't familiar with that little piece of our history, it illustrates that and illustrates our time period. So I hope that these three pieces here today kind of gave you some food for thought and make you see that documents really are great things, tell us a lot about our past. Um, again, if you have any questions, please comment and we'll get back to you. And if you have any requests, let us know that and we can get back to you. Um, so that's all for now. This is a really short one today. Please join my colleague, uh, Rachel Goldberg, next Tuesday when she presents a great hands-on activity for families on quilting. And she'll, that'll be next Tuesday. And join me again next week at noon on Wednesday when we look at the next section in this exhibit called Documents or Art. I'll see you then.